You're listening to episode 43 of the Confident Writer Podcast with Jane Pike. I am super thrilled to be here with Simon Kokoza, who is the author of the magnificent book that I've been diving into called Core Conditioning for Horses. Welcome, Simon. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Jane, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's, it's so fascinating to have this conversation with you because I think it's a really poorly understood aspect of training and how it is that we can basically just incorporate more understanding of how to condition our horses and get them working in a way that promotes happiness and health and optimises their performance. So I'm really excited to dive into it. <laughs> Do you want to give us a little bit of a background of how this came to be in terms of uh, an area of expertise and, and obviously um, writing the book? What, what's your background? How did this all start for you? Well, I, I started as a, a competitor and also a trainer. So I went through the British system and then I trained under European trainers. And I, uh, so I'm a, a qualified riding instructor mm-hmm. through the standard classical European system. What really led me onto the path of looking at the horse's biology was I started to very much feel that most of my riders and most of my horses were struggling with very much the same things. And because I'd studied sciences before that, I was going to be a physicist before I got confused by it. And um, (laughs) I decided to look at how they're made. And uh, then when I started to look at how they were made, and what reactions my riders and myself were feeling and the restrictions that we were getting, I saw that they actually all had a common root. Mm-hmm. And this was uh, the, uh, the internal geometry of the horse. Because, of course, you know, we look at the outside of the horse and we see all these big muscles and shiny coat and you know, nice eyes and so on. And we forget that, that inside it's, there's a million and one little moving parts, not unlike you know, a, a machine, but obviously a, a more supple organic machine with, with nerve endings. So really I started to branch away from competition, away from training people, and more into finding out what I could do to help the horse out of its problems and into a, an easier uh, performance. And so when you're talking about the system of the horse and the, the biology and all of the obvious composite and moving parts what that alerts us to is the fact that if something in one area is deficient or not optimized or not working in the way that it should be then obviously that affects the entire functionality as a whole and absolutely yeah and so what what led you to really isolate the core as the main point of focus well as you know with with a horse's body like our own a million and one things can can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that we tend to concentrate on what's happening in the head and neck. We see what's happening in the limbs Mm -hmm. and our horses have, uh, you know, I think we'll talk about it later, probably uh, swellings in the limb, wearing out the navicular and so forth. What I found was that these, 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 these problems that we had or that we see all the time are not isolated. So when you start to trace them back to their origin, mm. it, see, it becomes very apparent that the spinal column is an extremely intricate and precise piece of machinery. And when you start to look at a lot of x-rays and ride a lot of horses in the, uh, with the perspective of what is this horse's spine doing, you find that, in fact, a problem in alignment or flexibility, or range of motion along the spinal column resonates all the way around the body. So what I found was that we do tend tend to spend a lot of time dealing with actually secondary symptoms of problems that come from the spinal column. Now, how is that affected to the core? The spinal column is really just the the frame, the the scaffolding Mm -hmm. for the core musculature. Mm -hmm. So what what I found was when I started to influence the core, problems started to disappear, whether they be riding problems, health problems, physical problems, motion problems. And, uh, and so I, I, I come to the point where I think that almost I start with the core. Yeah. 
No, it totally makes sense. And I'm completely intrigued by it because I have a background in yoga therapy and way back at the start, I was really into it to kind of keep fit and, and make myself strong and nimble and all those things that you see online that you're like, yes, I totally want to be that. Um, and it also started from having back issues. And when I went into the therapeutic line of yoga, it was a huge, uh, <laughs> it was a struggle for my ego, to be honest, at first, because the primary goal of that practice was to optimize the spine. And everything else was secondary to that. So the movements that we were doing, the ways that we were practicing were very precise, incredibly slow, very measured, and everything focused on that core unit being the spine and the abdominals. And when I found myself practicing in that way, everything else that I'd been paying attention to as a primary point of focus, which was actually secondary to the, to the spine, like hips and those sorts of things that you might you know, typically focus on, all work themselves out because I was actually bringing myself into this central alignment. And so reading your book, I was like, of course, it, it completely makes sense. And then on top of that, you know, obviously I'm working from a human perspective there, but then we have the design of the horse where as a rider, we're actually placing ourselves in potentially what is one of the most vulnerable spots on their back and then saying, carry me the same way that you do without me. <laughs> um, so obviously there has to be an incredible amount of uh, support, strength and attention paid to how it is we're going about things in order to enable them to do that in a way that doesn't compromise them. Yes, added to which just like us they're not born with the knowledge of how to be a an athlete or a dancer i mean some are yeah. i mean for example i'm writing an article at the moment and i'm using an example of um uh, a horse that sold for 2.1 million dollars at three it's a tidy amount now why yeah you know we, we've all got a couple of those hanging yeah there. yeah exactly but, and the reason this horse is so expensive is because of course he has excellent confirmation and excellent movement so he naturally has a strong core but we're not all riding these horses and so really you know we have two battles or there are two fronts mm -hmm. the first front is teaching the horse to work correctly on his own it's his body mm -hmm. he needs to learn to use his body very well like an athlete and they're not mm -hmm. born with that knowledge so mm -hmm. it, it is true that that is the first challenge the second challenge as you say is is how to to condition the horse to such an extent that when we put our wobbly bodies in the middle of their back it doesn't affect them in such a way that it, it causes them either discomfort or, or changes the, the geometry and, and the mechanisms that are working inside to such an extent that we we we, we make life difficult for them physically and psychologically which unfortunately is the case yeah so in terms of the body organization and the way that you approach this i know the book outlines this beautifully but there there's very specific ways that you go about it do you want to talk a little bit about that or briefly about what the process is to actually engaging the core and creating a creating a system of training that that does what you're talking about well i've been playing with this for a while now and um i found that there's three main phases the first is release, because what, 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 what really we're facing, we're facing a creature that uses muscle tension to cope. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found that whatever you try and do with the horse to improve the core doesn't really work unless you've released the system. So mm -hmm. what I do first is I make sure that, the, um, that each section of the spine, each section of the core has... Uh, uh, let go of any sort of latent tension or spasm mm -hmm. and often it's spasm mm -hmm. particularly on the the large muscle either side of the uh, uh the spine called the longissimus dorsi that, mm -hmm. that tends to tense up through the whole length of the body which is why you can't turn left or can't turn right mm -hmm. because one of those longissimus is, is, is contracted and it's tight so you can't bend the other way yeah um so you have to release the system first so uh, i do a lot of walk exercises that um that and uh, it, that stretch and bend the horse to gradually ask these muscles to let go mm -hmm. now the second phase really is range of motion so what we want to do is to add range of motion to the different component parts of the spine now mm -hmm. 
the, uh, the the neck is very bendy. The neck works in three dimensions. It's a lateral, vertical, and rotational, the, uh, the cervical vertebrae. The thoracic vertebrae, on the other hand, because they contain the rib cage with the organs and the lungs and so on, they can't rotate. And also they can't uh, vertically stretch. So they only laterally bend. Now, obviously, they, they do dip under pressure because it's all flexible. And it's not meant to, which is where we get kissing spine from. And the, the lumbar section behind the saddle is, is fairly short, but it, it rotates and it vertically rounds, but it can't flex laterally. So mm -hmm. you have to deal with each different component with a different set of movements that isolate mm -hmm. each part of the horse, which is why normal everyday work doesn't do it. Yeah. Because the you're running straight lines and even lateral work, it, 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 the horse is capable of tensing up and using the limbs instead of the back. Mm -hmm. And that's why you end up with sort of a limited movement that, that never gets better. A year on year, the horse still can't leg heel properly, still can't half pass properly, and still doesn't bend around corners properly. Mm -hmm. So I'm processing as you're talking, but a couple of things sprung into my mind. I imagine that with that spasm tension that you're talking about or the residual tension, there's also learned holding patterns that are unconscious in the horse's body that they've negotiated or created in order to cope with the certain pressures that they've been put under so as part of that release phase is that really focused on teaching the horse how to organize their body in a way that's practical and useful in terms of carrying us um, and then as a byproduct of that does the release come or is that something that specifically you're targeting depending on how that particular horse carries himself and where the tensions exist in his or her body. It's targeted. It's got nothing to do with carrying us. Mm -hmm. It's to help the horse give up these, these uh, defensive tensions. Okay. Um, okay. Which they develop very early on. I think they develop it when we first sit on them. Because yeah. I think when we first sit on their back, sort of they, 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 they hollow a little bit against it. We can't see it because it's very slight, but they're creatures of habit. So, you know, if it starts on day one, You'll have it on day 10 and day 10,000. It'll just yeah. get stronger. Yeah. You know, and their resistances start to self-support. Yeah. And uh, as I said, because they've got very, very flexible limbs, they can live an entire life with a hollow and tense back. So unless we break that, you yeah. can't get to the core systems. You can't develop, you can't get the coordination and the range of motion through the spine. Yeah. And then you can't the, go on to, to tone it. Yeah, absolutely. Which is the ultimate goal. Of course, yeah. And then it, it seems to me that the, the actual equation, which I guess is physics, is that the amount of tension that you start with indicates how much relaxation you're going to be able to get through the movement. That doesn't exactly make sense. But what I mean is if you're starting with a level <laughs> of residual tension and you're trying to promote elasticity and flexibility and you know, this beautiful range of motion that we're after when we're out there working with our horses in, a, in an expressive way, that's going to be capped by the start point of residual tension or the amount of tension that they're holding in their muscles. So this release point then, I imagine, or the release phase also has a huge impact on their mental and emotional health because unknowingly that would manifest in spooking or uh, resistance or any number of kind of different ways that that might come out in sort of overflow. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that the, that that's an important thing is, is that this is a, a this is a, a herbivore mm -hmm. and they have been hunted for millions of years. So they've mm -hmm. got a, they've got a way of coping with life, which doesn't, it isn't like other mammals that we have. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, they don't, you know, when they're in pain, they don't squeal because yeah. help isn't coming. They can't help each other. So the, the, the way they cope is to hide their pain. And I think the trouble is with that is that we don't know. So it builds. And that's the only way really the communication happens, isn't it? Like you see horses being labelled as naughty or obstinate or uh, trainable or not trainable and all of these labels that come up that are really the only way that they're able to tell us, look, this isn't working for me or this hurts or I don't understand what it is that, that it is that you're trying to communicate. And I know that you outlined in your book there are the two or three different things that basically our, our horses try to tell us in terms of like what they're communicating. Do you, do you want to elaborate a little bit on the um, what 
can typically come up as a result of this tension or poor tone through the horse's core? Like some of the common uh, circumstances or situations that you see arise that are remedied by actually training in this way or working in this way? Okay, so let's divide that into two, um, behavioural and physical. Yes. Okay, so with the behavioural, as you said, they're going to be showing uh, resistance, unhappiness, unwillingness to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, there are many of them. Uh, we all know the horse that doesn't want to be girthed. Yeah. You know, uh, th- this is this is often because they're associating that you know they're simple creatures. They're wonderful and beautiful and emotionally intelligent, but when they make associations like saddle pain, when you put the saddle on and you go to girth it up, they know what's coming and they start to put their ears back or maybe bite you. They're, they're telling you. Yeah. Also, when a horse just refuses to do something despite however much repetition that we ask them to do it and they just will not provide it. Mm -hmm. There is, in my opinion, always a physical route to the, to, to psychological resistance because they are a herd animal. They are highly cooperative. If they weren't, we'd never get near them. Yeah. Then that's, you know, that's their really, that's their special quality. I mean, Mm -hmm. as you know, so I think that, Every time we do meet a psychological resistance, we need to try and trace it back to what we were asking at that time. Mm-hmm. Because there we'll have a, an answer to what part of the body that we've asked to engage or for them to use, and they may be finding it difficult. But that's good because then you can, then you can tailor your, your remedial program towards them being able to do that movement in its simplest, slowest form mm-hmm. until they gain, you know, mobility and, and body confidence in using that body part. Yeah. And, and then, of course, it will affect them less behaviorally. And is this something that you would start in hand as well or primarily are the exercises that we're talking about in the saddle? Well, I think it depends. I think that there's a, there's a limit to what one can do in hand. I mean, I've got yeah. a, the last exercise in my book, exercise 10, is something called the Giravolta lunge, which mm-hmm. is a, it's a very slow, low-impact lunge on a very small six-meter vault. So it's mm-hmm. a 20-foot diameter circle mm-hmm. in walk. Mm-hmm. But what, what we do is we, we use a, an inside flexion which gives uh, a shoulder in, three tracks mm-hmm. and what this does is it it aligns the spine for the horse mm-hmm. because if you're lunging a horse and if you notice horses on circles they tend to bring their quarters to the inside now so that what that means is that their spine is being held too straight the circle that they're on by the muscles that they're using so by counteracting that with the shoulder in and i think mm-hmm. de la Guerinière, he was i think he just rode, rode shoulder in everywhere yeah um <laughs> You know, I think he worked out after 50 years that it just helps, which it, yes. it does. They, not, they need us to align their spine on a curvature so that it drops into its groove, you know, like a zip. Mm-hmm. And then they can release and round. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that if you've got a horse that really shouldn't be ridden, then I do prefer to do it on the lunge. In mm-hmm. hand, not so sure, because the thing is within hand, is that every time you try and move the horse somewhere, you've got to induce movement, which often they don't want to do. So you have to get like pushy. And I don't mm-hmm. like to enter in that relationship with a horse. Mm-hmm. And also, once they do start moving, you can't control the outside shoulder. You, know, you have very limited control from the ground. And yeah. I think that that's another thing that's very important to remember is that when we talk about groundwork and we look at people who are experts in groundwork, like mm-hmm. the masters or you know, people working Spanish horses from the ground, teaching, yeah, these, these are not problem horses. It's not horses that are having trouble. Yeah. You're trying to cure a horse's tr- problems. You, you need to do something else yeah. because they will not use the, the difficult part of their body. They will always try to avoid it. And, you know, rehab is hard. And it if is. you're trying to fix something. The yeah. unpacking is yeah. much more difficult than starting from a, a blank palette. I think we've yes. all experienced that. What I found really interesting about looking at your exercises too, and this relates directly to what you're talking about now, is that actual curve that you're on or the volte that you're on is small. Like you're looking to actually manufacture that, that position of the body so that the spine is optimised for release. And that requires right. a very specific way of going about things. Um, so what muscles specifically are we referring to if we're looking at that releasing phase or that 
allowing phase? Well, the, the re again, the reason it's very small uh, is because if you let a horse get on a larger vault than a six metre or 20 feet, and you go 25, 30 or big 15, 20 metre circle, for mm -hmm. example, you lose control over the horse's straightness. Yeah. So they go crooked and they'll stay crooked and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. So you're just actually working the wrong muscles. Yeah. Okay. And you're also encouraging a, an incredible imbalance in the horse. If the horse is crooked and they're throwing weight onto the off outside four, for example, yeah. by bringing their quarters to the inside and you're cantering, you're putting 80% more weight on the outside four than you are the inside four, you're wearing that leg out. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it's a, just a bad road. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I go for what works right from the start. Mm -hmm. And referring back to this psychological piece, which I have a particular fascination with, presuming that we're working with a horse that has some stuff going on already, some pre, uh, pre associations with riding and work, perhaps some pain associations and uh, maybe a little bit of anxiety thrown into the mix, which tends to be the, the usual formula there. When you were working with that horse and say with students of mine, a, a common thing that comes up is um, separation anxiety or napping, we might call it here, from bringing them away from other horses. In your mind with a training program like this, when we're looking primarily to work with the body as the means of releasing all of this tension and getting into that psychological angst that they may be holding as well, does the pattern stay the same? Are we still working at a walk, looking at really measured ways of um, attuning and organising the body to allow for that release and then activating the core that way? Like is, this, is the approach fairly, I know it's tailored, but is it sort of systematic within the tailoring, if that makes sense, depending on what it is that's coming up? I think it is because, as you said earlier, you know, when the, when the horse is spooking or... Um or has pain or anxiety, it's often because they've got elevated hormonal levels, like adrenaline, for example, mm -hmm. probably as a byproduct of being in pain. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that by, by helping them release, certainly in that first phase, a lot of these triggers start to melt away because I think the, uh, they're not in a state of alertness, yeah. like they're injured. Because yeah. I think, again, it's a very, very base thing for a herbivore is that if they're injured, they're worried they can't get away from the tiger. Yeah. Um, all they can feel is back pain. They don't know whether it's a gaping wound or kissing spine. or They don't know what, what's wrong with them. Yeah. They don't think in that way. They just know they're compromised. Yeah. And I think it, it elevates their general – I mean, I, I, had a, I bought a, a mare in Germany, four years old, and uh, she had four kissing spines as I eventually found out, but she was a nervous wreck, mm. uh, afraid of everything. But as we separated the processes with, with, you know, a lot of intensive stretching, she calmed down. Yeah. Her environment didn't change. Just, I think her adrenal levels lowered. Yeah. And that Serotonin. begins with walk and really allowing for these releasing exercises to happen in a very uh, slow and methodical way. Yes. And you can tell because of course, I think it's Carl Hester mentioned, and I agree with this, that a horse should be able to walk, trot, and canter with their nose in, on, in the sand. If the spine is fully stretched and mm. unhindered, they mm. can do it. They can be in a grazing position, and, and the, the, the internals, they just alter, rebalance, and the horse can continue to move. In fact, it's necessary that yeah. if they're approached by a tiger, they can gallop away with the head still down, yeah. which is why they have the mechanisms that they have. So I think that if you're, you're, you're doing a stretch with a horse and they can't lower their nose below knee level in walk or trot, mm -hmm. well, you, you, you know that you have a, a restriction. I find it, um, I keep using the word fascinating, but I do find it fascinating. Like I can, I can literally uh, hear my brain sort of like going zzz, 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 as I'm like assimilating all of the information. Um, and I, I completely get and have experientially sort of, experience the that feeling of release and relaxation that follows so then what we're doing if we think about people who are emphasizing an idealized form over function so what we see a lot is we want our horses to go in this outline which is you know and there's words about on the bit and all of these phrases that get thrown around without a, a lot of understanding often behind them so what happens to the horse when we actually use gadgets or, 
or um, you know side reins or any sort of devices which are perhaps restricting the natural movement and mobility how does that actually impact their ability um, to work well and also the functionality of the core and what it is that we've been discussing well i think that the um if you're to take a human athlete uh you know we know we a, a dancer for example they do more stretching than they do dancing mm -hmm. so we know that you have to get the internals right for yeah. the externals to go properly yeah. and our uh, it is true that i think we've inherited from the military age the concept that if you shape the outside of the horse with equipment it will yeah. learn to go in this way yeah. But, you know, I think if we take our own bodies, we know that that doesn't work. If you try to make somebody dance well by, by, by strapping them into the right place, yeah. it'll just break them. Yeah. And this is what we see. You know, we, we see all the, the breakdown of horses, both psychological and, and physical. Um, it's, it's because we have insisted that, they're out, that the exterior of their body fits this format. And the thing is, again, it, it, with, it's forgivable because I think that when you look at the Spanish riding school, for example, and uh, our Olympic heroines and heroes, they are starting with horses that are naturally extremely talented. Mm -hmm. So of course, without much trouble, you pop them in side reins and pop in a double bridle, and they're on the bit anyway. You know, they're 90% they're of the way there. Mm -hmm. but of course, you take something that isn't, hasn't passed all that selective process, one of the ones that's worth a little bit less or not built quite right, and you try and do the same thing, and you're going to create stress points. Yeah. And, and again, you know, if it was a human, it would be screaming. But yeah. because the horse doesn't scream, we see what we see. And I think we're going to be really ashamed of what we've done in the future. I know you agree, because I've read your stuff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm surprisingly opinionated if you let me go with the topic. <laughs> right, okay. Maybe we should change it then, because so no, am I. No, I'd be here all yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm of the personal opinion that we have a huge obligation to our horses to be constantly searching for methods and ways of going about things that promote harmony, health and happiness. I think that that's our number one obligation. Um, and I've certainly trained with not, I've never been cruel or never not loved my horses or anything like that. But I look back now with the knowledge that I have now and I think I really wish I hadn't done that or I was ignorant to go about, you know, about things in the way that I did. And I feel um, upset in a way, you know, to think, oh, I could have done that differently or how did I not realise this, that or the other, but also really excited that the knowledge is there now that w that is available at our fingertips you know like you're sitting in france i'm in new zealand and we can have these conversations and now i'm able to bring that to my horses now and say look i i know a better way let's try and do i hope that i can serve you in a better way now that's great and you are doing and it, it, it will take time for it to filter through yeah uh, but there are some very vocal people you know there's gerd hoschman of course he has got a lot of good things to say yeah and that there are many more coming yeah, I think that, you know, the trouble is, it, you know, it is a business mm -hmm. and to, to get through to the producers isn't going to be very easy. The yeah. judges are going to take a lot of convincing. Yeah. That's um, why we have to start our own production companies. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's why we're doing this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely right. And write silly books about yeah. how to fix them. You know, I, yeah. I, I shared this meme the other day on my personal Facebook, Facebook page, which was um, tradition is peer pressure from dead people. And I thought, isn't that so <laughs> yeah, true? That, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it just made me giggle out loud. But what I find really fascinating is that I have lots of different interests and uh, like I have horse, I'm, I've delved into horsemanship. I have a, a real fascination with classical dressage training. Listening to you is wonderful. And then all of the different composite pieces where you can be like, okay, I can see how that could be obsolete or not apply anymore, but let's take this aspect of it and apply that with the knowledge that we have now of the core, for instance. So, you know, you can take these understandings from the classical traditions and say, maybe not that, but maybe this, and we'll add it to, add it to the ingredients that you're presenting. Um, and I think that not sticking your flag in the sand in one way is terrifying because it doesn't give you a solid framework to say this is right or this is wrong and then the other way really liberating because you're free to actually question what it is that's coming up and say 
but should we, or, or is that the best way just because it's been done for such a really, you know, for such a long time. So it's kind of, I think quite a formative time we're in. It, it is. Although again, I, I think that it's very important that we don't, you know, you know, rewrite the rule book. I, th- I think that it's classical equitation is correct. The thing is they're highly selected horses. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the Spanish riding school, they take far, they, they, they go through an exhaustive uh, selection process mm-hmm. to make sure they get the five best young stallions. Mm-hmm. So they avoid the ones that are tricky. Yeah. So of course their, their methods are true. Their methods yeah. work. You know, yeah. when it comes to pure equitation, I, you know, who am I to criticize? And yeah. I know they work, but like yeah. you say, I have, I believe, punished horses in the past for not going in the way that I read Alois Podaski told me to train them. And I thought yeah. they were being obstinate. I thought they were being stubborn. I thought that they just weren't trying. And, you know, that, that's not part of classical equitation because they never went there. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so, you know, if, if we're trying to do anything, we're trying to, I think, you know, this is, this is what I think that the modern kind of uh, ethical spirit behind modern equitation is, is say, okay, all right, we're going to train these horses classically, but what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the way they move and we're going to have a look at their bodies and we're going to make them able to be trained Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. classical horses. And I do think that it's possible because the more this kind of work that I do, the more I find that it's, it's, it's not very difficult Mm -hmm. to see where a horse is weak. Yeah. Isolate it give them an easy exercise to repeat on a daily basis. It, it strengthens them up. And then suddenly the work that you couldn't do beforehand, they suddenly can. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that is a sort of ongoing strategy. For example, that's why I, I created a, a 20 minute warm up in the book. It, yeah. it is so people, don't, they don't have to just sort of do it for two years. You know, they, they can work on their horse's weaknesses for 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. And then go and do whatever they want to do, you know, yeah. jump and dressage about or, and, and gradually their horses will make a, a sort of a week on week improvement mm-hmm. that they wouldn't be making if they went out and started doing dressage after a little walk, trot and canter. Yeah. Uh, because that, you know, the, the, their weak area is getting a little bit of attention before we add any concussion, stress, impulsion and so on. And so, yeah. and they do improve and they improve really rapidly. So I, I think that the goal is there is to sort of unite what we've learned from training humans. Completely. Yeah. To classical equitation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I believe in the classics. Oh, I, I, I do as well. It's more understanding the why behind what you're doing as opposed to just following through with a prescriptive formula. That's my, that's my main bag. It's like, well, why are we doing that? Okay. If that makes sense, then I will apply. And and if not, I'll continue to ask annoying questions. (laughs) 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 But yes, there's so, so much to be learned. So through your book, what people can do is actually ascertain the core score of their horse. And as a consequence of that, there are a series of exercises of warm up exercises that incorporate this release um, mobilization activation that you're um, speaking of is that the do you want to talk us a little bit about that about what the core score is and um, and what what is behind behind that yes of course well I think that uh, what what I've noticed is that you know the horses the horse's way of going really does betray the physical function that they are experiencing inside their own body. So mm-hmm. um, it's very important to know where you're starting. And I think, so, so what I did was I tried to put down, I grouped it into zero to five. Mm-hmm. Zero being a horse that is completely free, completely loose, the, the ultimate athlete. And five is a horse with kissing spine, in pain, yeah. can barely move. Yeah. And so, and, and, and all, all the different gradients in between. And, and that gives you a starting point to sort of know what level of exercise to go in at. Mm-hmm. So if you're going for a horse that, you know, you, you're, let's say you want your, your canter half pass to, you're getting sevens and you want nines, mm-hmm. then you can probably start the exercises at a point that are adequate for that horse. You don't need to go back to the drawing board as if you would with a horse that's suffering or very, very tense. And so by scoring the horse from zero to five, you you, you can decide at what point you approach the issue. Mm -hmm. The thing is, a lot of horses are absolutely fine 
in 90% of their body. 90% of their core is gray. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a problem, uh, uh, you know, a, a core score four, if you like, a, a severe muscular issue, or in the case of kissing spine, a uh, spinal process that is touching, some bone on bone, where there's nothing else wrong with the horse. So it's very important to, uh, to use sort of the exercise groups to identify what your horse can and cannot do because it will be able to do some things yeah. fine. Yeah. But one thing, terribly. Yeah. But again, it's detective work. And there you go. If you can identify what that is. So the, the core score graph is just to really work out the general symptoms that you're experiencing when you're training your horse, for example, you know, a very common one. A lot mm -hmm. of people can't bend their horses to the left. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the horse is resistant down the left rein. They can't therefore take an outside rein contact through the right rein because the horse is hanging on the left. Well, what it means is the horse's body is triangulating and bringing the quarters to the inside. So it's falling towards the left hand side of its body through mm -hmm. the left rein. Mm -hmm. Well, what this means is that, in fact, the, the, the horse is, um, is unable to bend the right-hand side of his back because he's very tense in the right-hand side of his longissimus dorsi. Now, why is he tense there? He's tense there because, like us, nine horses out of ten are right-handed, so they're stronger on the right. Yeah. So if they're going to block, they'll block on the right-hand side, I, even though it feels like you've got a problem on the left. You, you have to be like a biomechanic sleuth to, um, to figure out the course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I've got <laughs> magnifying it's... glasses. Yes, so yes. Much. Here he comes, Simon with his magnifying glass, <laughs> figuring out where the blockages are. <laughs> Amazing. That, and then, sorry, continue on. Well, I think that, that that's quite important because I, I, I've spent 30 years trying to work this stuff out. And I started from a good place of, 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 of mechanics. Yeah. So um, I think that what it was very important for me to do is not do what I find a lot of other authors and professionals do, and that's just baffle people because yeah. that doesn't help the rider sort, sort their horse out. So it, it, it took me a year and a half to write the book, and it took me another year and a half to make it simple enough to understand and execute. Yeah. Because if they can't execute it, it's not going to help the situation. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it, you know, you can refine these things down simply. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do a turn about the forehand, for example, the horse walks out of the outside shoulder. Well, you, you, you know, it doesn't matter why, but you know what you can do about it if yeah. you have the confidence to actually sort of get in there and say, okay, well, I'll have to, you know, keep the bend, but half hold on the outside shoulder and then sort of tap them up with the stick and say, come on, cross over a little bit. And once yeah. you get that first step, you can get a second. So, you know, it doesn't require a great deal of knowledge to, to effectively solve the problem. And that's so important. But it does require the targeted knowledge to kind of know what to do within it, doesn't it? Which is exactly what you outline in the book. I've suffered many decades to, to learn how. I can imagine. <laughs> and I wouldn't really wouldn't want to put anyone else through that. <laughs> it's a really fabulous book. Thank you so much for, for um, writing it and illuminating all of the things that we can do out there with our horses. Um, I know that lots of people listening will be jumping up and down in their chairs going, yes, yes, that's me. That's, that's the horsing situation that I'm in. So if they are interested to learn more about your work or work with you or read your book, where should they go? What, what's the best place to find you? Well, obviously the book is the great place to start mm -hmm. because it's all in there. Mm -hmm. And that Talking. can be got on Amazon and uh, horseandriderbooks.com. In uh, Australia, I can't remember the publisher, but anyway, you know, it's, you just Google it. I'm not coming to Australia or New Zealand just yet. But, not yet. Uh, I do, not yet. <laughs> I hope to one day once I can sort of work out how to do the flight without going insane. I'm a little claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do go to the States a lot. So if, 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 if they just look at my Facebook page, uh, Core Conditioning for Horses, I give a full list of my clinic dates and lecture dates. In, awesome. in America there, and I do the odd thing in Europe too when I Fabulous. have time. Fabulous. And I'll, I'll put all the links in my show notes as well so people can zoom to your awesomeness and find out um, all about it. I have the book too. I highly recommend it. And I think that I just, like you said, I just jumped on um, Book Depository or Amazon and ordered that, and it, it was um, 
arrived in my post box, which is always a happy day. I think we can also, you know, the flight situation, we can work on that. We could either break it up into small jumps to get you to news towards Australia or New Zealand or, <laughs> or have the ways and means to help with flight anxiety. <laughs> I'm sure there are drugs that can just knock me out for yes, 12 hours. Exactly. No, no, that's probably what I need. Exactly. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Simon. It's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jane. It's been fun. The details again for those of you keen to check out Simon's work. The book is called Core Conditioning for Horses. And given we are such a global community, I think that your best bet of figuring out where to access that is to type that into Google. I know that it's available on Amazon. I ordered mine through Book Depository, so it's certainly available in those two places. Simon's website is viscontecocosa.com and I will put a direct link to that in the show notes on my website that details all of the clinics he mentioned as well as some other super interesting bits and pieces that you will be wanting to check out. Thank you so much again for joining me and I'm looking forward to hanging out again in the next episode.